Thanks for downloading Pave the Way Podcast. On this show, your host, Greg Helbeck, interviews the top minds in real estate, business, and personal development to help you crack the code so you can grow your business and, more importantly, grow your life. Get ready for another game-changing episode. If you want to learn how to master your day and become a productivity monster, download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's pave the day spelled D-A-Y dot com. Now it's time for today's episode. Enjoy. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm here with I'm here with Van Sturgeon out of Toronto, Canada today to uh, talk to us about how to do rehabs the right way. I'm really looking forward to having him on the show as a guest. And I know we had to reschedule this thing once, but I'm glad we're able to have our calendars line up to where we can spend some time together today. No problem. Well, I appreciate you uh, having me on your uh, podcast. I, I've, uh, I'm a fan of yours. And I'm looking, I was, like you mentioned, we've, we've tried to set this up uh, in the past, but uh, we're finally the stars of a line. And now we're going to we're gonna get rocking and rolling. We're going to talk about something I'm really passionate about, about rehabbing, renovating properties. The awesome. Right way. Well- that is the right way. You're right. Cause that there's a, uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the rehab. I always tell people like there's two parts of the business. There's like, I'm in a market for a house business and that's like sales and marketing. And there's a whole slew of things to talk about with that. But then there's the, I own real estate business, which usually requires the, the, the fact that you need to renovate the property, which is a whole different skill set. So some people are good at finding houses. They're terrible at rehabs. And then the opposite is true as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to really getting into the nuts and bolts on how to do it the right way. So before we get into that, can you just give the listeners a little bit about your background and, and kind of where you're at today, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. Sure. Um, I'm a I'm a general contractor first and foremost, and also a real estate investor. I've been doing this for over 30 years now, and um, I've got a number of successful businesses in property management, uh, home builder, um, and renovation restoration. And uh, I own over a thousand doors. I think I'm closer to 1,200 now. Uh, I'm sort of semi-retired uh, right now in my life, and in I see that there the reason why I'm out uh, there, uh, you know, t- talking to folks like you as well as others is uh, there's a real need for information out there for people looking at how to properly and successfully renovate their properties, rehab their properties without you know running into a lot of the difficulties and horror stories that we hear about all the time. You know, that dumpster that sits in a driveway that you keep uh, of a house that's being renovated that's been there for six or eight months. You know, I could build a house in three or four months, but yet that dumpster sits, you know, sits there for so long. There's issues out there in the marketplace. So I'm preaching a good work. There's a system that I've developed over the last 30 years that I really want to get out there and tell, tell people and hopefully guide them through the, you know, be able to get into a proper, successful rehab renovation of their property. Oh, I'm so glad people like you are out there talking about this, because like I said a minute ago, like there are so many people that I know, and this has happened a little bit to me. I've gotten okay at managing rehabs and I've had other people do it for me. So it gets me out of it, but they'll buy a property at the right number, but the rehab, especially where I'm based out of is New York, the New York area. There are a lot of permits and regulations involved with that. So if you get a stop work order, or if you're in San Diego, where I actually live, and you get red tagged, you're done. Because like and, you know, every area is different. You know, like some some areas you can get away with it more than others. So um, no, really you're absolutely you're absolutely right. All across North America, I've I've helped people out in their uh, in their rehab renovations, and it, there's it's just a hodgepodge of different types of regulations. And some areas require uh, contractors, young contractors, to be licensed. Some areas don't. Um, so. You know, but nevertheless, the whole process is the same everywhere you go. And um, it's just a matter of uh, a lot of folks go into these things without actually having the processes and systems in place to ensure that they're successful, right? Absolutely. So let's get right into it. So when it comes to doing rehabs the right way, so you can obviously have a, a certain outcome, which is a completed project, and then obviously be on budget, be on time and, and minimize the liability, like Let's just have today, obviously, we have 25, 30 minutes to spend, so we probably can't get into the whole system. That's why, you know, at the end, we'll talk about some things that you offer. But what are just some some pillars? Like if we're going to 80, 20 everything and, and find the 20% that really are going to bring most of the value, let's just have you start talking about like some of the absolute keys we'll, we'll drill deep on 
so listeners can take something away from this podcast. Sure. And, and, and I have a, a six step process that I've developed over, over the years that, that, that I am out there and I'm promoting and, 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 and hopefully your listeners will be able to listen to and get some real valuable information uh, by the end of this. And to start, uh, one of the things that we as successful real estate investors have to have is being able to identify the deal. Yeah. And part of that, the, the, the component of finding that great deal is that, you know, we're buying ugly ducklings, diamonds in a rough. We're never buying a truly perfect property. We're buying an uh, of asset that is undervalued because it requires some repair, some renovation, some rehabbing. And so we got to put a component on that, that dollar value and able to figure out whether it's actually a deal that makes sense or doesn't. And so it's one, uh, it's, it's really important to find those deals. But I think it's equally important to have that skill set to be able to not only evaluate a property properly, but also be able to initiate a process where you'll be able to get that number in that process. Because you, I can give you a great deal, Greg, but if you don't know what the hell you're doing on the rental side, I've seen devastations. I've seen you know budgets that have been at you know fifty thousand dollars all of a, all of a sudden explode to one hundred and twenty just because they weren't able to look after the property, or identify the certain things that they needed to do. And we also come across situations where properties are over renovated. So, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, and you can see them all the time and they're sitting out there in the marketplace, newly renovated or whatever. And they're just sitting in the marketplace because they just overpriced themselves out of the market. So one of the first things that I, that I advocate is goals. We need to really establish what the goals are for this particular rehab renovation. Um, whether it's uh, we're looking to make $30,000 on the flip, whether we're looking to raise rents by, you know, by $400 or raise them up to $1,200. We need to have a clear, I do a fine goal and have it literally written, written down because everything that we do in the process of putting together the systems, you know, to be able to carry forward a proper or successful renovation needs to have this goal in place because everything's being going to be filtered through it. It's going to be our, our, our guiding light. So if we're looking yeah. to do a flip and we're looking to make $30,000 on it, that's great. And so we got that. The next thing that, I, that I'm an advocate for is that we go, kind of go out there in the marketplace and we need to validate that goal. We need to go visit comparable properties that have sold or about to be, be sold and really key, key in on the specific details associated with that property in comparison to ours. Did this property have a foyer that was or foyer four year with, with uh, ceramic tile versus carpeting? Did they use real hardware or laminate? Did they renovate the bathrooms? Did they not? Did they have a one piece to uh, toilet or did not? All of these little nuances, factors need to be written down and sort of understood or being able to conceptualize in your head about how to get my property to this property in terms of using that as a guideline to get me to ultimately my goal, right? And a lot of times I find a lot of folks going out there, newbies especially, um, on paper looks great, you know, the numbers make a lot of sense, but they really don't do their market research of really get into what is it that my property does not have uh, in order to be able to get me to my goal. You know, unfortunately, there's certain things that we can't do. We can't manufacture additional square footage. So if I were to go to a rental property down the street that's renting off for $1,200 and mine is at $700, I want to get it up to $1,200. Well, if that house over there is 1,200, I mean, it's 1,500 square feet and mine's only 900, that's pretty difficult for you to be able to overcome. Amenities like pools and stuff like that, they're difficult to overcome. So we need to be realistic in what goals we establish. And that's why we have that validation process to be able to really keep it real and really be real about the property I have and what are the steps that we need to take in order to be able to drive the bus forward. Um, does that make any sense? No, no, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yes. no, it, and that's that's how you start the that that's foundation. Like if you know that your goal is to sell X house for three fifty, and you know exactly why that house sold for three fifty in terms of what was done to that property, let's say it was flip comparable. Now you all, it's almost like you have a cheat code, and then it's just like the problem to solve for is like how do we do our rehab now exactly how this one looks so we can now. You know, it's not that fuzzy black, white, you know? Yeah. And, and see, and then, but unfortunately, a lot of folks real, uh, uh, you know, in this day of age with the internet, really a lot of folks rely on going out there on, on Zillio and, and places like that to get their information. And I, I strongly encourage, especially if, you, if it's your first couple to go and visit these properties that are for sale or I've sold to see what it is actually that they're, that, that they've done to the properties 
and and then you know, like it says, a cheat sheet. That's a cheat code that you can use for your property because ultimately you should be able to get the same valuation, the same say you should be able to hit your target. Um, once you've been able to validate 100%. your goal, that ultimately uh, you got to then go into your property and look at your property with a very critical eye. And it's a process that I call uh, creating a needs and wants list. Essentially, it's like a clipboard with a line right down the middle and you identify things that are needed to be done to the property. So uh, a, a roof that is leaking is a need. No matter which way you cut it, you got to spend dollars to that actual repair. Um, uh, things like that. If you got a broken window, elements are coming in, that kind of stuff. You got to put that under your needs column. Then you get into the into other items that, based on your market valuations, based on you know the validation process, things that you want to do, things that you look at and you say, you know what, that shaggy lime green carpet that's in the family room from the 1980s, maybe you know, if, even though it's you know it's in relatively good condition, it's something that we could uh, you know repair uh, re, you know replace if it's within our budget. Um, those are the items that we itemize on our one side. So essentially we have this list where we've done an inventory. We start from the outside and we circle the property. We get on the inside, we circle the property, first floor, second floor, and we literally go through room by room, jotting down everything that needs to be accomplished within that particular, that you'd want to see or needs to be done within that property. Now we've got a list of things that we got to do to this property. And I would imagine if you did the process, if you've started this properly and that you got some type of validation or market research done, that this list should be really fine-tuned in what you need to do and what you want perhaps to do if the budget allows for it. Um, the next that. stage, right? And then the, the next stage uh, or, or even before that is to evaluate, determine, figure out money. How much money do we have in the budget to, to apply toward this renovation rehab? It'd be nice if we had uh, unlimited sums of money, but we don't. We need to have, we got to have a budget and make the best use of that budget. And so part of the thing is how much money do we have cash on hand? Do we have access to lines of credit? Do we have um, you know, hard money lenders in place that are able to borrow that we, that we can borrow money from? All of those types of things we need to figure out beforehand, obviously, and we need to have a dollar figure of how much money we have to be able to contribute to this renovation, because ultimately when we move to the needs and wants list and determine which we're going to do, the needs, of course, we're going to accomplish because we have to. But on the one side, depending on what our budget allows us, we're going to identify the items they're going to deliver the highest ROI. So one of the things I often find in, in real estate and you know, newbies that are going in there is, you know, they immediately gravitate towards something like, you know, if you're walking into a 50, 70 year old house, they immediately gravitate toward having to replace windows as an example. You know, sometimes it'd be nice to replace windows if you have the money in your budget and you can see it's, a, if you can get some real serious ROI out of it, ROI out of it. But Oftentimes, I find that it's a huge capital expenditure that isn't needed if you're looking at it as a position of, you know, a flip, that there's other things that you can do within that property and on a renovation side that's going to deliver much higher ROI than it would be to replace windows. Also, I, I find a lot of folks uh, try to shoot for the highest mark in, in, you know, in renovating their properties and reaching their goals. So if the market valuation, for example, in, a, in an area is 300000 they want to get to that point where they bought this property low, they want to renovate and they want to shoot for the stars to get that $300,000 mark. I'm not an advocate of that. I'm a person who likes to go in there and, and, if, ever, uh, and just quickly turn property over. So if I was in a market where top dollar is $300,000, i am going to position my property at that 290 285 level so yeah. that I can move product. And a lot of people want to shoot for the moon and the stars in the sky, but it's not really, this, you got to look at this as a business. And the longer that you have your dollars tied into a project, the you know, those opportunity costs, there's opportunity costs, there's opportunities every single day that you come across that you can't get into because you're still, you know, you're still holding on this particular property. So I'm an advocate of always, everybody wants to feel like they got a deal. So sometimes we uh, withhold things that we could do to the property, let's say, for example, replacing windows, reducing our you know, the, 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 what we're going to sell the property for so that we create an attractive uh, uh, opportunity for somebody who's going to think that they're, you know, that they're going to buy at a cheaper price than what the market rate is. 
but they have this, they know that they're going to have to repair it, but they might repair it a year, two years, three years down the road. Long as we don't have a need situation where the window is broken and it's around the elements in, then we, we got to, then we avoid some things like that, these huge capital expenditures, and we address other things that deliver the highest ROI. So what you should be asking me, Greg, is that. my, what, what, like, what are the things that you should be doing to be able to get the biggest bang for your buck? And, and what I tell folks, because I'm asked this often, is um, you know, there's nothing better than spending money on curb appeal on, uh, on the exterior of the property, because that's where you get the highest ROI uh, in terms of setting, up, setting the stage consciously and subconsciously for that individual who's looking to buy that property or looking to rent that property by having something that aesthetically is appealing. And I will spend dollars and they're really, really not a lot of money we're talking about, but in landscaping, maybe recoding the driveway, you know, just adding a top coat of a, a sealer like on it to bring it out, cutting the grass, adding some flowers, uh, painting the garage or painting the front door, maybe adding some shutters to the, to the exterior, really making this place stand out in, on that street. And there's a number of really you know, yeah. incremental, small little effective things that you can do that really delivers that wow factor that it's amazing to see. I've done, I've done literally thousands of renovations in my life. It's, be, it's, a, it's amazing how people will go through that property differently when they, you know, when you've dressed it up uh, on the curb uh, appeal side, they walk in and they're, they're able to sort of, uh, of uh, not avoid, but it's kind of rationalize in their head, ah, well, that's okay, the kitchen maybe is not isn't renovated, or well, that's okay, the bathroom isn't renovated, because they've been wowed by the outside. And it's really, really consciously, subconsciously so important, that wow factor, that curb appeal that brings people in through the doors. And then again, if you strategize and you adjust your prices accordingly, you'll be amazed at how quickly you'll be able to move the property. I love that. And that's such a good takeaway too, because like you mentioned this earlier in the, in the call, people will over renovate houses. And I've, I've done that once, I think, and it just, it obviously, spent money and where I didn't need to spend it. And I ultimately didn't get an ROI on that aspect. But like you said, if you really know how to make the property like pop, right, make it pop. So when someone walks in, they can, they can be like, Oh, wow. Like maybe like, for example, like the lighting, like just the lighting on the property where like that doesn't cost that much to put led lighting. I have them right here. And that makes the property more appealing or like doing the landscaping outside, or like you said, sealing the driveway, little things like that are so powerful. And I think that that is where I see a lot of rehabbers make mistakes is they'll put this crazy interior in, but they'll leave the exterior looking like crap. And all of a sudden people are going to the house and like, ah, I don't got a good feeling about this house. They haven't even walked in the door and they don't even like it. You know what I mean? So it's so important. Like you said, if people just did what you just said over the last two minutes, they would make so much more money in their business. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, absolutely. Unfortunately, folks uh, that are new to this don't have that, uh, don't have that, the skill set, don't have that experience. And that's, uh, that's what I help them through to being really identify those, re those high impact uh, items to be able to deliver the bus, deliver, uh, deliver you to your goals. Um, and, it, and, and like you said, like I see it all the time, over renovating and and you know renovations can run, can be very expensive. The average renovation now on a single family home is up in that fifty thousand dollar kind of range, and, and 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 it's easy to get there. Yeah, every bathroom is going to end up costing you five to ten grand. A kitchen can cost you ten to fifteen. Flooring ain't cheap, and painting a house ain't cheap. And then when you add all of these things up, you know you get to see that fifty thousand dollar price range. And so what, how do you maximize that budget of yours to be able to get the highest ROI, maybe even going under budget? That's what, uh, that's what I, I promote and teach. And I hope people can, from this takeaway, can get that takeaway. For, uh, the biggest takeaway from this is that you got you to gotta look at it that way and be able to get to your goal. But ultimately, uh, the next step in my process is once you've been able to identify those items, uh, is creating a detailed scope of work is the next step. And oftentimes, especially in multi, in I'm sorry, in single family homes, uh, you rarely see anything detailed. And that's one of the biggest issues that I find folks fa do, uh, doing is they don't get into creating that detailed scope of work and really itemizing what it is they're looking to accomplish in a property, 
creating some sort of a processes within the, like what you're looking to accomplish. Um, those are the things that are critical and having uh, put in place, because if you don't have that information, I don't know how any bona fide general contractor, if you elect to choose to use one or doing the work yourself, if you're going to go directly to an electrician, a plumber and painter, if you don't have that information in place, I don't know how it is that you're going to attract good quality contractors or trace people. And if you do attract them, whoever you're going to attract is going to be individuals that you're going to get quotes that are all over the place. One of the uh, common problems that yep. I come, uh, come across is one, we can't find good quality contractors and trace people out there to quote on our work. Two, if they do find somebody that quotes on it, they're, they're, the quotes come in, they're, they're all over the place. And you can't even compare them because you know, they're all over the place. There's, they're, very, they're very vague and it's just a dollar value. And so how do you yeah. compare? How do you know what you're getting from one guy versus another guy, right? That's yeah, a, it's a big problem. It's huge. It's huge. and I've seen too by doing this. When I when I tell the contractor, or if the project manager tells the contractor what we're going to pay, and they, they they know that we're like not messing around, and they know that like we know what we're doing, and they're not going to be able to like take advantage of us. Like if I was brand new, I'd be like, oh, I don't know, you know, what do you what can you quote me at? But I'm like, hey, dude, a boiler costs seventy five hundred dollars to replace. I'll pay you. I know that's what it's worth. So like they can kind of see that when I have a scope of work set up, they're not, like you said, they're, and I've learned this firsthand. They know that I know, already know how to play the game and they're not going to number one, try to take advantage of me. And number two, a lot of the smart ones, they see this as a continuous relationship. It's not like you're one off rehab. It's like, Hey, I'm going to call you once a week for a house. So not only do you have to give me a reasonable price, but this is something that we can keep. It's a repeat business. And when good contractors notice that, they're not going to be the highest price because they know they're going to get business from you all the time and you're going to refer them to people. So that's that's another thing that I've done to really keep good contractors in my database uh, is showing them that I know what I'm doing. You know, I, I, um, I, like I speaking on, as a general contractor myself, um, I, I'm, I'm very busy. My companies are busy, but we are always looking out for other opportunities or clients to be able to, to, to start a relationship with. But if I get a phone call from somebody uh, randomly who says, yeah, I'm thinking of doing this, I'm thinking of doing that, and uh, I'm not returning their phone call. I'm not going to waste my time quoting, uh, or, uh, you know, because it takes a lot of time and money and energy to quote. So I'm only going to deal with, because I'm busy already, I'm only going to I'm only going to deal with individuals that come across that are professional. And part of that process is creating a scope of work, a detailed scope of work that shows that you're on the ball, you know what the hell you want, and I'm not going to waste your time. I get to the point that in my process of creating such a detailed scope of work that literally, uh, whether it's a general contractor or even an electrician, a plumber and painter, don't even have to visit my project, be able to put a price together. And, it, and you'd be surprised when you get to that point, when you know how to craft one that's that detailed and gives your contractor and trace people the information they need, you'll be surprised at how many quotes that you'll get but not only get from random people, but you're going to get them from good quality contractors or trace people. Because guess what? The dodo contractor, trace person, the newbie, the person that just came and decided one day to become a, you know, try, uh, you know uh, to get in the business who don't know what they're doing. As soon as they see a detail scope of work like that, it just scares them away. They won't price it out. Yep, they run away. They don't want yep. because they, they themselves don't know. They're not sure of their own business. They don't have the experience. So by having a detailed scope of work, I'm going to attract the good quality people who want to work with me and I want to work with them. And, and it's a beautiful process. So this whole issue of I can't find tradesmen, I can't find contractors, it, it doesn't exist with the people that I work with because I know that they are out there. They're looking for work, but they're not, uh, they're not coming. The reason why you've had difficulties in the past of finding these people is because you presented yourself in a wrong way. Totally. That's so true. And especially when you have your stuff together, you're going to attract people who are going to have their stuff together. You know what I mean? And the, the biggest thing I've noticed too, and this is kind of tied to the scope of work when working with contractors is it's all about, you know, having the open line of communication with the contractor and managing the expectations correctly. Like if a contractor tells me, Greg, I'm very busy right now. Generally I can get your project done in five weeks, but right now it's probably going to take seven weeks. If he communicates that to me and I accept that, I'm not going to be disappointed if it takes seven weeks, but if he says that, 
And then it takes 12 weeks when he told me, it was, see, that's when people get pissed with contractors. It's all about the communication and managing the expectations. And I've found that the good contractors that I've worked with are just very good at communicating and being upfront with me about what's actually going on versus like not calling me. And then they're like animosity happens and then no one knows where everyone's at. And then all of a sudden you fire the contractor and it turns into a fiasco and you got to you know, a job that's sitting there and you're just, you're angry, you know? So that's a big thing. I'm sure you've seen that as well. Thousands of times at this point. Absolutely. But, and and that's where, um, that's where the next step in my, in my uh, framework is (laughs) as a nice segue is that the whole tender contract process, um, you, uh, when you've, uh, when you've tendered out your scope of work and you've got these quotes that are coming in, you're going to narrow it down to those individuals that you, you know, perhaps you're going to want to use for your project. And it's, then you got to go out there and check references. And sometimes I find yeah. a lot of folks because they're busy, don't want, or lazy, don't want to do that, but it's a, but you need to do that. You need to go look at because quality is relative. What's quality to me might not be quality to you. So you oh, need to, oh. you can't take, you can't just take someone's word for it. You got to get over there and take a look there current projects or previous projects and hopefully maybe even run into the principles of those previous projects to find out hey you know what did these guys met, meet your expectations look at the finished product and ultimately determine whether you want to do business with them totally. and then once you've been able to get to that point you identify the party you should by this point have identified somebody who's a good quality bona fide operator to be able to do business which then now you transition into the contract phase which is um they're going to present you with a contract for you to sign, but there are certain conditions and things that I'd like to see within those contracts. Also, a biggie is that you need to create as part of your the contract, a denim to the contract, your uh, scope of work, because that is the Bible. That's the guiding light that is going to run your process through you know, uh, to make sure that you get what you're supposed to get in this whole, at the end of the day, is that detailed scope of work. It needs to be part of that contract. And, and one of the things that I strongly recommend people to do in that process of figuring all of this stuff out is that you create two things. And these are the two takeaways. So hopefully people will, uh, will get out of this podcast, well, a bunch of other things, but in particular this. Within that contract, you should have a progress schedule and a payment schedule. You need to have two of those within your contract. Because a progress schedule on a weekly basis or every you know second week, Whatever that is that you establish with your general contractor trace person, you are on the ball. You are notified. Uh, you, everybody understands and knows that this is what we're looking to accomplish within each of that week. So at the end of every week, there should be some type of report from your contractor trace person that says, yes, this is where we're at. And then you move on. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be there at the job site, Greg. If you have uh, these lines of communication, you should be receiving every Friday at by 12 o'clock, two o'clock, whatever, some type of a report, whether it's you know by the phone, whether it's pictures through an email, video, it's, it's, it's amazing. I have clients all over North America by virtue of this, you know, with the Zoom technology, FaceTime mumbo jumbo, right? And so you, uh, you can have that too, where the contractor will walk you through and show you what your pro- the progress is. And if you oh. haven't hit those milestones, you haven't hit the progress, then you got to stop and you got to say, wait a minute here. We're to week three, but we yep. only, we, we're only finished week one. What's going on? Yeah. And you <laughs> need, a, hey man, it's like uh, it, they're, the expert of what I find is that folks don't do that. They fork over 30, 50, 70% deposits down. Oh. I've heard some really crazy, crazy stuff. 70%, oh. I've heard people put down 70% deposits to these contractors, trace people, and hope that these guys will work out. And oh. I, isn't that craziness or what? That, I, I mean, that is, uh, that is like, that is, I, I cannot believe that. I mean, I, I'm like, I'll give them like enough money to start the rehab, pay for the dumpster and say, you got to earn this next check. And, and I know I pay fast too. I pay like, if I know that, yeah. like, but I would never give a contract. If he told me I need 70% down, I'd tell him to go fly a kite and say, the hell out of here you know but that's one of the things because you're you're a veteran at this you've done this uh, yeah. uh, you've done this a couple of times and so have i yeah. but unfortunately folks out there uh that listen to your podcast have not so and they're frustrated they don't know why nobody's calling them they don't understand why they get quotes are all over the place 
And then they got the man that says, give me 70% uh, up front or 50% up front. And I talk, and I, when I'm dealing with folks like this, uh, I, I say to them, listen, you can't, this, these guys are not McDonald's where you go, you know, McDonald's, you got to pay up front for your hamburger and, and wait for it to be, these, none of these guys are McDonald's. You got to no. pay to perform. Go try that with your employer. Go to them and, and say, I like to get, you know, a month's worth of uh, wor- uh, wages up front. What are they <laughs> going to say to you? What are they going to say to you? They're going to tell you to Why take a kite. Yeah. As we say in New York. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's so, that, so that, yeah, it's huge. So right. you got to incorporate that within your actual, uh, into the contract, uh, have a progress schedule. You know where the hell you're going with this. And I also create milestones and payment schedule. Everything's up front. Everything's very clear. And, you know, in, in week three, you got to have certain things accomplished. This is you get paid week six, blah, blah, blah. And these are the types of things that I, that I walk people through and help people through. And it's a beautiful process. These, this whole notion, this whole bad karma mumbo jumbo that's out there about all these contractors are bad people. And this, you know, I blame contractors as much as I blame the actual investors or these homeowners. They're the ones who create their own misery because they yeah. don't know what they want. You know, I've literally so, yeah. seen people contact contractors, grab them by the hand, walk them through their property, showing them this, that, and the other, and expect the contractor to come up with a quote. Like, that's not how you do business. How do you know that the information you gave to one contractor is the same as the other is verbal? I forget things. You got to have it in writing. You have a detailed scope of work. You got to be able to go to your painter and say, hey, man, before you paint that wall, I want you to clean it. I want you to sand it. I want you to blah, whatever that process is. You want to also tell your painter that, hey, buddy, I don't want you. How many different types of painter out there, uh, Greg, from the same paint manufacturer? different qualities, different sheens, different, all that stuff. You got to die. You got to identify that. You got to, you got to write that stuff down. So you get proper quotes, because if you don't, what ends up happening is, well, guess what? Who's, what type of quality of painter you're going to get for your project? If you just let the painter decide or the general contractor decide, you're going to get the worst. You're going to get junk. Yeah. It's going to be the cheapest because you didn't specify. And whose fault is that? Is that the contractors or the trade? That's person? the investors. But everything is their fault. It's it's, it's a yeah. self responsibility game, man. I had that happen to me actually not too long ago. I, uh, I I bought this mixed use commercial building and I was rehabbing one of the units. And the guy put in. He made a mistake. Maybe he was drunk or something. But once again, that's even my fault. He put in like the two different floors in the kitchen. Like, it, like they were two different colors. And I like walked in there one day and I'm like, dude, like change that crap out. Like, and he was like, yeah, I'll do it for free. But like, it's my responsibility to catch that. If he finished the job and I didn't see that till the end, I mean, like, you know, he, at that point, like, you know, I'm not going to go, you know, it is what it is. So you got to be on top of these guys and get out gals if you're hiring them. And, and you got to be able to, like you said, be specific. Cause if you're specific, they, it, it's very easy for them to either accept that or decline that. But if you're like, I oh, just throw the best color in there. They're going to throw like pink in there. And then you'll say like, well, why'd you put pink in? Well, you just told me to throw the best color in there. I felt like that was the best color. There's no black and white there. You know what I mean? So it's so important with contractors, man. You but, couldn't but, have said that better. So, so Greg, is, uh, you brought up something interesting. So I'm going to ask you that this will help your, uh, folks. Uh, if you had in that same situation where that tile was two different colors or whatever, but you had paid that guy up already, you given him his money. Where do you, ter- where's your negotiating power in getting that guy to make, to fix that mistake? What would it be if you've already paid that guy? Or oh, if he's got a payment schedule, you set up a payment schedule where you're always behind, meaning he's, produ- you've already paid him in advance the things that he should have accomplished by now. Would he have been all that eager to replace that floor? No. Exactly. Because my leverage went away. Exactly. That's why I'm very careful with paying them. It's like, I don't pay until the job is the segment of the job is done because if you, like I said, if I pay a contractor and he does all the work, he has the money. Why would he call me back? I mean, hopefully he has integrity, right? But like, you don't know if he has integrity or not. That's out of your control, Billy. So when I still have monies for him, he's going to be more receptive to me. And that's just the way you have to be. I mean, there's just no getting around that. That's just the way it works in reality. So um, that's a great point. Don't overpay. Don't pay ahead of schedule. Don't be generous and give him 10 grand just because he's a nice guy. Like, you know, everyone's a nice guy until they screw you over. Ask me how I know, you know? So it's like, that's just part of, part of, of of doing these rehabs in the systematic format. 
and, you and know? that's why and that's why I'm an advocate of the process that I just listed. And, and, and I can go to every single little step that I mentioned. I could talk hours about, you know, the do's and don'ts and all that kind of stuff, uh, that kind of stuff. But ultimately, if you follow this, uh, the framework I'd identified, you uh, should be uh, shouldn't have any of these issues. You're going to have your contracts with trade people under rain, under your I don't want to say leash, but you know what I mean, where you got them in control. You're in control of the whole process. You, you know, and I, I often find a lot of new real estate investors when they get involved in these renovations that they take on a mine of their own and they turn into these vicious animals and they lose control. How many times, and you may, maybe in your early days, you've come across this where you hire a contractor and he keeps promising you're going to show up. Uh, he's going to keep showing up. And every morning you wake up with that pit in your stomach wondering if that's the day. Is that the day your contractor is going to show up and do work? And a lot of folks out there listening to this podcast are going to know where I'm coming from. And, and it's such a miserable feeling because you're being taken advantage of. If you follow the framework I just laid out, you ain't gonna, you should not be have any issues whatsoever with that. Totally, you very well said, and they can take this from this podcast, implement that, and immediately start getting results. But if they wanted to get more involved, I appreciate you coming on. This has been an awesome, very, very, very informative show. I'm sure a lot of people, if they're not driving, are taking detailed notes. Now, if people want to learn more about you, maybe they want to get involved in anything you have to offer. What is the best way, number one, to reach out to you? And then number two, if you have a website uh, where they can visit to check out some stuff online, if you have anything to offer. Well, I'm all, I'm all of, I'm, I'm on uh, social media. So I uh, go out reach out to Instagram, Facebook. I'm, I'm there. Um, but probably the best place is just to go to my website, vansturgeon.com. There you got a, uh, I've got a, I've written a number of uh, books uh, that you can download for free. I'm really, I really want to help people. And that's the reason why I got involved in this. I, I know the pain and suffering that people go through in these renovations and I feel really badly and I know how it feels. So I'm out there a big advocate and trying to make sure that people are, you know, are getting what they're paying for. And, and it should be an effortless process. It should be a fun process. So go to my website. Uh, I've been on a number of podcasts. There's lots of information on my website. Uh, and if you want to contact me through there, you're more than welcome to. And there's a bunch of free stuff that I have on there. Like, uh, like I said, eBooks, renovation calculator, stuff like that, that they can download. Awesome. We'll put it in their show notes there on a listening. She'll put it in there, vansturgeon.com. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show today. And uh, I'm sure everyone is going to get a lot of value from this. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of Pave the Way Podcast. We hope you got value from today's episode. Make sure you download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's pave the day spelled D-A-Y dot com. If you have any questions or want to reach out, head over to www.pavethewaypodcast.com. We'll see you on the next episode.